There we go. Perfect. Okay, so now let me hand over to Julia. Yeah. It's all yours. Absolutely. Okay, can you see um, my Google, 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 Google Slides? We're off to a great start. <laughs> can you see? Okay, cool. Well, um, as as Ahmad said, I'm Julia Wester, and I'm here in southern Sweden, so not quite as hot as you all are in the UK with the temperatures, but uh, it's starting to be summer. Um, one interesting thing is that here in Sweden, it's so odd to me, maybe it's normal for Europe, but um, you don't know it's summer until 10 days after summer has started because summer or spring or any other season starts after you've had 10 sustained days of a certain temperature, you know, at least a certain temperature overnight or something like that. So it's very strange. It's not like calendars, but anyway, we are definitely in summer. But what I'm here to talk to you about today is <clears throat> predictability and forecasting and how to use flow metrics to get started on that journey of improving your predictability and how to start doing forecasting in a way that's, you know, not so time consuming, right? But still gets a lot of accuracy. Okay. So that breaks down into these high level topics. And um, please interrupt me, raise a hand, say something in chat, Ahmad, or say if you see something in chat, that's a really good question um, that's timely, you know, just we can stop and, and talk about that. Uh, that's not going to hurt my feelings at all. Um, but we're going to talk about what predictability means in uncertain environments, um, measuring the four key flow metrics. And at the same time, we're going to be talking about charts to use to look at those. Um, and then how to take those flow metrics and use simulations for creating, creating forecasts that are risk aware um, and, and, how, and talk about how they're risk aware. And then a little bit on how to um, introduce these, maybe a good order to introduce them and why um, that order might make more sense. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with asking a question. Does anyone work in an environment where you have zero uncertainty? So a completely certain environment. You can use, you can like wave at me, you can put the little, a Zoom reaction? No, I see a no, right? Okay, I'm not seeing any yeses. Okay, so then I presume that you're all on the same page with me, that if you have uncertainty in your life, in your work life, then you cannot give a 100% forecast because there are things that you don't know will happen that are outside of your control, right? So what we're going to be talking about today is how to take your data in uncertain environments and turn that into a forecast. So I'm going to talk about a flow metric first, and then we can talk about what predictability looks like um, in that data. How can you look at your data and see if you have predictable delivery? Um, <clears throat> but it's going to behoove you to remember throughout this talk that um, you're, you might find yourself thinking, but I want to know for sure. And we just have to remember that you told me at the very beginning of this meetup that you don't live in 100% certainty. And you're going to have to remind yourself over and over. And you have to remind the people at work over and over. And that's honestly the reason why we have methods like Agile. Oh, Agile is not a method, but why we have things like Agile and, and the Scrum framework is because we realize that there are things that we don't know and then we can't know them all up front. So we're going to adopt these ways of working that help us learn along the way. But yet when we get to forecasting, we expect that, oh, but that doesn't apply there. I can still be certain over here, but yet realize that I can't be certain over there. So we have to bring both sides of our brain into, into um, cohesion there. So let's dive right into the four key flow metrics. And the first one uh, is cycle time. It's the first one that you'll probably start with measuring because it helps you set the groundwork for all the rest. Um, it is in, it's a, a metric of elapsed time, okay? And elapsed time is the complete time it takes for your work to move between two points in your workflow. And so generally that means from start to finish. 
Now, so let's say I'm looking at a board and I've got to do um, researching, executing, validating, and done, right? I can pick any point there as my start point and any point there as my finish point. As long as you're on the same page about what your start and finish points are, then that's the framework for all of these flow metrics that I'm talking about. So while a team might be focused on the start point of when it leaves the, the backlog or the options list and goes into say our first active state like researching, that's when it starts for us. So that's our start point. And then when it is delivered to the customer, that can be our finish point. So we'll use that for our frame for this conversation. Um, but just realize that someone else in your organization might be looking at things from a different angle and their start point might be earlier in the workflow. It might be before it goes into the backlog. They're looking at a longer part of your value stream and they can still use all of these flow metrics to look at their portion of, of your workflow and how to move things through it more quickly. So we're gonna think from sort of like leaving the backlog, say a researching phase or something like that into delivering something to someone. The cycle time is the complete calendar time, the complete elapsed time, including weekends, including holidays, including time that you went home for the evening that it takes for work to move between those two points, okay? And so cycle time is very, um, very helpful in answering questions like how long is it likely to take to finish a single work item? We'll talk about how you can do that and what service level expectations can we create? And we'll talk about what service level expectations are as well. And for cycle time, the way that we calculate it is um, the end date minus the start date plus one. And the plus one is important because that lets us include both the end date and the start date. So they're included in our cycle time. So if you look at this here, it left start, uh, spent three days, it had some waiting, you know, all this time, and the cycle time is 14 days. So when we're looking at a bunch of different work items that have been completed, and we want to look at the cycle times of our work in aggregate, we want to use something called the cycle time scatter plot chart. Okay. And on the x-axis here, or the horizontal axis in the bottom, it tells us the date at which items are completed, okay? And where dots are placed vertically shows us the cycle time of that chart. So that elapsed time that it took from start to finish. And so each one of these dots represents one or more work items that's been completed in the past, okay? So we can use this data, this collection of dots to do quite a lot of things. Okay, we can see that um, we have some outliers here. We can see we have clustering here. We can look at patterns and we can drive discussions about, hey, what was happening that caused these to be here? Is that a different type of work? And those just naturally have longer cycle times. Were these four items um, blocked for some reason, some external cause that we can control. So the cycle time scatter plot is a very good chart for helping us sort of research um, what happened in the past to cause certain items to take so long. Okay, and um, it when I um, I'll come back to this chart in a little bit, but when we get to forecasting and we talk about what data do we use to forecast this can be a really good tool to drive discussions to help us answer that question. Um, so if we, if we have time, we'll come back to that. But one of the most powerful things that we can use the cycle time scatter plot chart for is helping us forecast how long it will take to finish a future single item of work. So each one of these dots is how long it took to finish a past single item. And we can look at them in the aggregate to figure out how long it will take to finish a future single item. Okay, so how do we do that? Anybody have an idea of how we might do that? Anyone use the cycle time scatter plot before? First time seeing this. Yep. It's a uh, percentile number. Yeah, absolutely. So we have these percentile lines right here. 
And as, oh, whoops, backwards. Essentially, we're, we can look at this you know, scattering of dots and say 50% of all the dots on this chart finished in seven days or less. So if I had 100 work items represented on this chart, say 100 dots, I would count up and draw a line at the point in which 50 dots were below the line and 50 dots were above the line, okay? And whatever cycle time that line ends up being on, and here at seven, um, gives me some information about how quickly we do our work on average, right? So 50% of the time, our work finished in seven days or less over this time period that we looked at, okay? Um, do you think anyone would be happy if you told them uh, the other way to say that, there's a 50% chance that a future item we start will finish in seven days or less. Does that feel helpful to you as a stakeholder if I said 50% of the time we'll finish this item in seven days or less? Why not if you don't think so? Because 50% of the time you're still wrong. Absolutely. You're as wrong as, as often as you are right. Right. Now, we say wrong and wrong has a certain connotation, but what we mean is it's we hit the downside as often as we hit the upside. And since we know we can't be certain, we know there's going to be times where work will fall outside of our forecast. So what we have to do first is we have to think about what is our comfort level for hitting the downside? How often are we OK with doing that? We're usually not OK with doing that 50 percent of the time. But are we OK with doing it? 30% of the time or 15% or 10%, right? So we can calculate these other lines exactly the way that we counted the 50% line. So again, if there's a hundred dots on this chart and we wanna find the 85th percentile, we can count up so and draw a line so that 85 dots are underneath the line and 15 dots are above it. So the place at which 85 percent of the work items have been completed. And on this data set, it's 16 days. So we have, uh, you can draw any line you want anywhere. In the tool that I'm showing here, Actual Agile, we have four lines drawn normally, just by default, okay? And what's interesting is that we can use this as a forecast of how we are likely to finish future work. Okay, if the way that we, the way that I like to think about it is that the way that we work and the conditions in which we work have allowed us to achieve these outcomes, okay? Um, that 85% of our work finishes in, in 16 days or less. That's a fact about our historical data. If nothing changes, if the conditions of the work that we're doing doesn't change, um, the conditions that we work within doesn't change and things like that, then we should expect to achieve similar results. If nothing changes, expect more of the same, okay? So if, um, if you know, my team's not changing size, nothing drastic is changing, then I can expect over the next, you know, period of time that 85% of our future work will be able to finish 16 days or less. So that kind of forecast is what we're gonna call our SLE, our service level expectation, okay? And that's something that we can use as a team to help us, um, to help us quickly forecast without spending a lot of time, but also as a tool to help us manage and get to future predictability. And so I'm gonna talk about how to do that here in a second. So this SLE, if you've noticed, the way I've been speaking about forecasts, there's always two parts, okay? There is a probability, so 85% of the time. Uh, you might also hear someone call that a likelihood or a confidence level, um, but there's 85% of the time we finish work items in, and then we have a range. So 48 days or less, 24 days or less, whatever your number is, we're not saying 85% of the time we finish work in exactly 48 days, we're saying 48 days or less. So a probabilistic forecast is a forecast that has two components, probability and a range, okay? 
And any time that we have uncertainty, the first thing we talked about, and we all agreed that we have, any time we recognize that there's more than one possible outcome, then we really do need to think about thinking in these probabilities. What are the likely, since we can't be certain about the outcomes, what are the likely outcomes that are happening and how likely are they to happen? Okay. So once you, once you figure out um, what your historical data says, then it becomes a conversation of what's that risk level that we're willing to take, right? And then one of the things that I see quite a lot, I don't know if this is your situation, but um, say you're in a scrum team and you're doing two week sprints, okay? So how often if you're doing two week sprints, do you expect to uh, deliver work? In other words, how long do you think your cycle time should be at most if you're doing two week sprints? For stories, you mean? Yeah, yeah for stories. Three days? That's really uh, ambitious, but that would be awesome. Yeah, what if I told you that this was the historical data for a team that thought they were working in two week sprints? 85% of their work actually finished in 48 days or less. And these are story level stuff. So what does that mean for that it team? Means, it means that uh, stories are being carried forward sprint after sprint after sprint. Yeah, and that happens a lot more than you know we think, we like to think it does. So um, even if you have a, con a construct like a sprint that is helping you focus in certain cadences, don't forget to check your data to see what your actual results are. Are you actually finishing work in the time periods that you think they are? Um, so all that to say that if I think I'm working in two-week sprints, or if I know I'm working in two-week sprints, but we're not finishing our work in those, we're not going to be satisfied with telling our team that, hey, 85% of the time, we can be confident we can finish work in 48 days or less. What we would rather see is something like this. Uh, maybe, this isn't the best, but we want to at least get our SLE to be no longer than our sprint, right? But what's wrong with this SLE? I mean, Paolo, you said three days. Why would we want something more like three days instead of, why isn't 14 days good enough in a sprint? Well, because we want the team to collaborate as much as possible. We want to see stories um, uh, compl closing um, and not, not starting before you close stories. So we want mm -hmm. to see more than one team member working on a same story. We want to limit work in progress. We want to start finishing, stop starting, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. All of those things are good. I mean, but if our... If our SLE says that 85% of the time we finish work in 14 days or less, I mean, that does mean sometimes we might finish work in one or two days, but we don't have a high confidence that if we start it in the middle of our sprint, that it can still be finished in our sprint. We'd be much happier with, with our SLE being something like this. 85% of the time we finish in seven days or less, or in Paolo's case, three days or less, right? Because then at least we know that if we start something halfway through our sprint, we still have an 85% likelihood of finishing those items before the end of our sprint, right? And getting ourselves capable of getting our work done in smaller and smaller time periods um, creates a lot of other positive aspects of that kind of experience. Now I've been talking a lot about sprints, um, but this kind of construct or this, this way of thinking is beneficial regardless of, of what kind of methodology you use. If you use Kanban, Scrum, XP, whatever you're doing, um, this is a good tool for you to use. So what I like to remind people is that, so this here might be your actual SLE. It's your historical data is telling you this is what you can expect. So I'd call this your actual SLE. But this is what I would call your target SLE. This is what we want to work on to get our actual SLE down to, to meet our target. So we wanna bring those lines together, right? Now, there's another thing that we can use this SLE for, and that's something called right sizing, 
Okay. Um, when we're looking at fighting, is our story small enough or is our epic small enough? Or Because this can be used at any level. I'm using a lot of team level words, but you can take these this information and just change those words to a different level and it still works in the same way. But if I know that I want my uh, items to finish within a two-week sprint and I want my SLE to one day be seven days or less, then in sprint planning or in our replenishment meetings or whichever type of, of you know, planning meeting that you're doing, you can use that and say, is it at least small enough to finish within that SLE, right? Uh, so I'm not necessarily having to say, is it the absolute smallest I can break it down, which is totally, you know, you can totally do that, but you can use the SLE to help you define if an item is small enough to start and help you improve your predictability. Okay. So um, yeah, one more thing is that if you think that it's not, then you can know that ah, I still need to do a little more refinement to break it down into smaller yet still independent, independently valuable pieces. So um, small is good. Uh, it's hard to know when small is small enough. And this can be one tool that you can use to help you answer that question. You may want to get it smaller, but from a predictability standpoint, if you use this, you'll know that it's small enough to positively infect your, you know, improving your predictability. Okay, so that's cycle time. Cycle time, the elapsed time from a start point to a finish point. And by looking at all of those individual cycle times, we can get this amazing forecast, this SLE that can help us, um, that we can use to forecast how long it'll take to do a future piece of work. And we can use it to improve our predictability in a way I'll show you here in a moment. But the second, the second flow metric that I wanna talk about is throughput, okay? And it is a rate metric. And there are other kinds of rate metrics like velocity is the rate at which you finish story points in a given period of time. But the flow metric, when we're working on improving the flow of work items, we like to specifically measure the exact thing we're trying to optimize. And the thing we're trying to optimize is the delivery of work items. So we are measuring the rate at which we finish work items. And so this is often expressed as like the number of items in a day, a week, or a sprint, okay? So you might see, you might have a throughput of one item a day, six items a week, 14 items per two week period, okay? so. Cycle time and throughput are both metrics that are lagging. They tell us about stuff that's already happened, right? And we use the cycle time metric to help us understand how long it will take uh, to finish a future individual item. But throughput has a different benefit. We can look at the rate at which we finish work to help us determine how to forecast for multiple items. So the, the question that it can help us answer is how many items are we likely to finish in a given period of time? And it can also uh, tell us when we can finish um, a given body of work. So cycle time for single items, throughput for multiple items. And the throughput run chart is a chart that we often use to measure this. And it is very similar to the cycle time scatter plot. Um, but there's just one dot for each time unit. I'm showing day here. So for instance, on this particular day, we finished 10, on this two, um, we have some zeros here. Now, I see a lot of zeros that are clustered in twos. What do you think those zero days and clusters of two probably are without looking at the calendar? Weekends? Weekends. Absolutely, yeah, right? Um, so we are looking at the entire calendar and we're looking at, um, you know, what's happening on each day and weekends aren't the only time that we deliver zero items. Sometimes we deliver zero items on a work day and then we have a batch of other items. And sometimes on a weekend, 
someone might actually finish an item, right? We haven't talked much about whether or not to exclude weekends. And if you're interested in that, we can talk about that at the end. But sometimes thing happen, things happen on the weekends and we don't want to exclude that data, okay? So in this, you can sort of see your variance over time. So I can see at a glance here that we deliver anywhere from zero to 14 items in a day. Now, 14 doesn't happen nearly as often as zero does, right? And so there is a, there's some variation in not only the number, but in the frequency that these numbers happen. And we'll talk about how to use that. Um, but there's a traditional way that people use this data. And so here's some stats. I'll say that uh, here's a throughput metric for you. You completed 12 stories in one week. That's a through, you know, that's one data point for your throughput. And you have a, a project or an effort of 120 stories that aren't yet started. How traditionally might you go and answer, when will these 120 stories be done, given that information? It's a standard way of doing that. 10 weeks, right? Yeah, and how just we probably know, but why don't you tell us how you did that? Uh, based on uh, the throughput of the previous week, where yesterday's weather, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, we're just saying, okay, 12 stories in one week. That's probably what we'll do every week. So 12, you know, stories a week for 10 weeks equals 120. It's just a simple math problem, right? But the problem is, is that we're working on average. And there's this great book called The Flaw of Averages by Dr. Sam Savage. And um, that's a great book to read. But a good thing that comes out of it that helps us to remember is that plans based on average fail on average. We talked about how in the cycle time scatter plot, how we wouldn't want to say 50% of the time work will finish in seven days or less. So we don't want to use one single data point and peanut butter it through or use any kind of averages to help us create a really robust plan because averages don't help us do that. They're wrong as often as they're right. Not only that, the average might not be very likely right? 12, 12 items in that week. How often did that happen? And sometimes the mathematical average, if you're doing averages, might not happen at all. So I love uh, this website, mathwithbaddrawings.com. A uh, great place to go to help have fun learning math stuff. And this is a great example of how averages can be misleading. So a young guy walks in and he's like, well, what would my average, what would my starting salary be? And the boss, you know, trying to sweet talk this whole job says, well, the average starting salary is 80,000. But if you look at the data point, he's not wrong. The mathematical average of all the individual salaries are 80,000. There's not a single person at that company making $80,000. So we have given a very misleading forecast to this person about what his salary is gonna be. It's more likely going to be $30,000, right? Um, and not anywhere near what he thinks the average, which means room to grow, right? So he's going to be one very disappointed camper. And we don't want to have our stakeholders be very disappointed campers, right? So there's a better way to take our data and give a more risk-aware forecast. And that's with something called a Monte Carlo simulation. Okay, so if you look at this chart, there's a lot of stuff going on here, but this top area here looks like a chart we just saw, right? This is our throughput run chart. It's just a dot for every day. In fact, you know, uh, we still see our, our clustered zeros. So this is our throughput of, for each day. So on this day, we made we did nine. This day, we did three, et cetera. So we've got our historical data for our team, OK? And then we can use this simulation and give it some information. So we gave it this throughput, the rate at which we finish work, and we've given them lots of examples of how much we do in a given day, right? And then we're telling it, hey, how many days are we trying to forecast for? Because this particular uh, chart, the Monte Carlo how many simulation, we're saying given this throughput and given a start date and an end date, how many items are we likely to finish? So if I say we're going to start work on May the 9th and end on May the 23rd, given this throughput, it can tell me 
how likely we are to finish um, a certain number of items in that period of time. Now, how it does it is pretty cool, right? <laughs> so um, everyone has noticed that there, you know, we don't just have 12s across the board here. So we can't do what Paolo helped show us that most of us like to do when we're just given some simple information, right? Um, we know that on any given day, we could have any one of these particular outcomes, right? And we don't all, we're not always able to control and always get the best outcomes. So some days we're going to have zero, some days in the middle, some days a lot, and we don't necessarily know which day is going to be which. So a Monte Carlo simulation is a statistical model tool that helps us say, okay, I'm going to I'm going to run some trials of what can happen in this two week period, in this time period. And it's essentially, it's going to say, okay, on May the 9th, let's just grab a random day from your past and see how many you got done that day. Okay. It's going to write it down. And then on May, the, it's going to say the next day, May the 10th, and it's going to go grab another random number from your throughput, say maybe the six right here, it's going to write it down. And it's going to do, say, one trial of that two-week period, and it'll come up with a number. Maybe it's, maybe it's this 36 here, right? That trial came up with 36. And it's going to do that over and over and over 10,000 times or more. And it's going to tell you all the different outcomes that have happened and how often they happened. So if I go back here, I can see that this histogram here, and histograms aren't super human readable. There's other ways that you can look at this, but each one of these bars represents a possible outcome. So we see, you know, some, we see some numbers here that help us like 25, 30, 36, 40. Those are example outcomes of things that we could complete in that two week period. And we even had some outliers here of 80 items or more. But the thing that we need to understand is that the height of the bar tells us how many trials had that particular outcome. So the really short bars did not happen very often. And the really tall bars happened quite often, right? Now, if I, so I said this, uh, this Monte Carlo simula simulation ran 10,000 trials, right? And each one of these bars shows how many occurrences each different outcome had. So that means if I stacked all these bars on top of each other, this y-axis over here would go all the way up to 10,000, right? So how do we take all of this information and make it something usable, right? Well, what I can say here is that um, you see that we've got some percentile lines here that can help us. From this 50% line here, uh, from this all the way over to the right are 5,000 of those trials. So much like in the cycle time scatter plot, where we said, let's draw a line where 50% of our dots are below the line and 50% are above the line. We're going to draw a line here where 50% of the trials are on one side of the line and 50% of the trials are on the other side. And so what I mean by that is that I can say that 50% uh, there's a 50% chance that we'll finish 36 items or more, because it could be all the way up to 80, 82, whatever these outliers are, but 50% chance that we'll finish 36 or more items in a two-week period, okay? Oops. Now, we don't like 50%, so we do the same technique to draw the line for 85%. So if I know there's 85 or 10,000 trials, I find um, the line where 85% of the trials have finished. So 8,500 trials show me that um, I can finish 25 or more items. So 85% of the time we'll finish 25 or more items. Okay. Are there any questions about that and how that works? Very cool. So it's interesting that in both, in both ways, whether it's a cycle time, like an individual item being done, or a day or a week where you've got a 
throughput number that you've generated, it's like every day you're you're doing another test run to see what that could be. So each one, each thing that you do provides another, um, you're doing another experiment, right? This one finished in this many days, or this day we finished two items. And so your Monte Carlo simulation is taking all of your trials that you've done in the past and running simulations with them and telling you out of all of that, what's most likely to happen. And the cool thing is that um, we use, and you would want, if you're doing this manually, you'd want to use a random selection of your data points. And what that allows you to do is it allows the shape of your data to affect your forecast. So if zero happens more often, zero is more likely to be chosen, right? And if 12 happens less often, 12 is less likely to be chosen. So the shape of your forecast is really taking to account the, the number of times different outcomes occur in your, in your uh, data. So I'm uh, sorry, a little geeky about that, but it's a lot of fun. So we talked about cycle time and throughput, and those are all lagging indicators. We can't change that if we wanted to. These are things that have already happened, right? The, the, the ship has left the port, okay? But the other two flow metrics are leading indicators, things that can help us make a difference before the story's closed, right? And one of the most important flow metrics we have is just simply our work in progress, the level of our work in progress. That is the count of work items that we started but haven't yet finished. So they passed that start point but have not yet passed the finish point. Other words are on your board, right? If you're using boards, okay. And what do you think? If you have lots of work in progress, um, does work take longer, uh, more time or less time than if you had fewer things in progress? What do you think? Longer. Longer. Yeah, absolutely. There's a relationship called Little's Law that shows us that there's a, there's a relationship between work in progress, cycle time, and throughput. And we see this happen a lot just anecdotally with ourselves, if we have five things in progress at any given time, and there's one of us, and we're splitting our time between all those five things, then each one of those is going to take longer than if we just focused on a single one. Okay. So generally, the more whip we have, the more likely each item will uh, take longer to finish and if things are taking longer to finish, then that ends up affecting our throughput, the rate at which we finish the work. We finish less and less most often. So because we know there's that correlation, that's what makes WIP a leading indicator. So if we have, if our WIP starts going up and we start working on more and more things, we should probably expect to see, unless we've increased our capacity to finish work, we should expect to see a downturn in our cycle times, worsening cycle times, and maybe worsening throughput. So um, if you monitor work in progress and correct it, you can get ahead of that before it actually comes into play. So, but this chart specifically, um, just by looking at the chart, literally tells us how many things we have in progress right now. And by looking at the trends and the shape of the data, we can see if it's increasing and know if we have those um, specific issues. And much like the uh, throughput run chart, we look at WIP on a run chart. So instead of things that we finished on a given day, this is just things that are in progress, things we haven't yet finished on a given day, but otherwise it works exactly the same. Okay. Yeah, and this is the Little's Law relationship that, that I talked about. The relationship of work in progress, how much gets done and how quickly, another way to say that. But there's an advanced chart. It's not one of our you know, charts that tells you exact information about our four flow metrics, but there's an advanced chart called the cumulative flow diagram that actually gives us a little bit of a visual of Little's Law in action. It's one of the only places that we can see information about our cycle time, our throughput, and our work in progress all at one place. So 
Um, what's interesting here is you, if you see this key, you see that there are colors here in the key and you see these sort of blobs of color on the screen. Um, this isn't a chart that I'd show the people who are afraid of charts because it's a little bit overwhelming with all the stuff, but I like to think of it, if you notice this legend looks a lot like the columns of a board maybe. And so in a way, this is a board sort of laid, you know, tilted, laid on its side and each column has its own color, right? And if you notice what the axes are, the bottom horizontal axis is a given day, right? And the vertical axis is the number of work items. So I can then say, if I can tell that the vertical axis is the number of work items, I can look at the height of any one of these color bands and see how many items are in analysis active on that day, how many were in dev active testing, and even cumulatively, it's why it's called a cumulative flow diagram, how many are in done, right? So the vertical space of each band tells us how many items are done. And you can look at it in each one, or we can look at it like here. I can see adding all of those up together that on my board, there were 29 work items, right? Now, the other thing that you can see here is the approximate average cycle time that it took for items to finish. And we look at that by looking at the, the distance between lines on the um, on a horizontal axis. So we had 29 items in our board on that time. Around that time, things had an approximate average cycle time of eight days. So we start to see this little triangle of relationship and the slope of this any line is, uh, the slope of this done line shows us some information about the rate at which we finish work. If it's super flat, that means the amount entering done is not increasing. So our throughput isn't, isn't is zero or, or lower, the steeper it is, the more it's entering done and the higher our throughput is. So it's not the place you go to get exact information, but it's a place that you can come to see the interplay between these three, okay? So I wanna show you this a, a little bit. So if, um, one thing I wanted to show you here is so, if the shape, if the slope of your throughput line or the, the line that goes into done here at the bottom, the slope of this blue area here um, has a, a parallel sister, say, and that's the um, slope of when things enter analysis active. So the rate of start versus the rate of finish is one way you can look at it. When things enter here, you start, and when things enter here, you finish. So we can look at how parallel those lines are to each other, right? And if they stay very parallel, that means our whip is staying pretty constant and our cycle times are approximately staying constant, right? But if, if they start to diverge, that means that our whip is going up because there's more space between the lines. And that would also mean then that our cycle times are getting longer because there's more space between the lines. So it's a cool place to come and see the interaction between three of our four flow metrics. And um, yeah, it, it's pretty fun to dig into. Now the last flow metric that we have is work item age, okay? And I would probably say that this is the most important one to pay attention to. It's very, very similar to cycle time, but it's elapsed time since the work has started until today. It hasn't finished yet, so it doesn't have a cycle time, right? So work either has a work item age or a cycle time, has a whip or a throughput, okay? Now, the questions that this kind of information helps us answer is how old our work in progress really is. And that's something that we don't, it's not easy for us to see. You know, some of the tools like JIRA or uh, Trello and other things may have some mechanisms to help us get an idea like a dot for every day or a dot for every week or the, color, the card might turn colors as it gets old and decay. There's some fun things in Trello, but it's hard to know sometimes exactly how old items are. And I don't know about you, but unless we know that information, it's hard for us to pay attention to it, okay? Um, but the other cool thing that we can do with this 
is to help us understand if our items are going to um, fall within that SLE or exceed that SLE that we talked about earlier. So I'm gonna share how to do that. Now, in Actual Agile, you can build this chart anywhere you want. You can build it by hand, you can use other charts, um, but this chart has a couple of cool features. Um, and what it looks like here is we've got your board laid out. If you haven't noticed, a lot of our flow metrics use your workflow. That's why we call flow metrics, because we're helping them optimize how the work gets through that workflow. Okay. So we've got each workflow stage on your board as a column. And so what that means is each dot represents a work item, and we can see what column it's in, where it is in the process of being done. But the placement vertically, is how old it was since it started. Remember, since the start is our frame, so the age since it passed that start point. So I can see that this dot represents one or more items that are in analysis active and started five days ago. I've got this item, one or more items here in dev active that started, that entered this board 12 days ago, okay? So the higher the dots are, the older the work items are, okay? Now, we have some percentile lines here, and those aren't generated from this chart. What we're actually doing is taking that information from your historical data, your cycle time scatter plot, where you said 85% of our work finished in 16 days or less in the past, right? And that's because we have to look at age in context. We don't, if I were to say your item's 12 days old, you might be thinking, well, okay, but what do I do with that information? Is that good, bad, or ugly? I, I have no idea. But when we put our historical data into context and we know that we're using um, an expectation for ourselves to say, we need to finish 85% of our items in 16 days or less, or if we're trying to become even more predictable, maybe we wanna finish them even faster, we can use that information on top of how old our work item is to help us make day-to-day -day managing decisions, okay? So if I want to keep my 85th percentile line here at 16 days, what do you think that means I need to do with uh, in regards to finishing my work items? Anyone have an idea? Move the items that are already in breach above that line? Yeah, I, I do have uh, two, I have some that are that are uh, beyond 85 percentile. Is that is that wrong? Is that bad? What do you think? No, because they, they could be part of the 15%. Absolutely. So first of all, we don't need to feel like we've done something bad when something passes an SLE. That's why it's not necessarily the same thing as an SLA where there's penalties associated. This is something that we're using to help us manage our, our own internal expectations and to help us improve our predictability. So we know by the sheer percent, the, the sheer fact that we're saying 85%, we know that 15 odd percent of our items probably will finish longer than that if we stay on the same trajectory as we've done in the past. But we can use this line to say, if I want to maintain my ability to say 85% of our items finish in 16 days or less, that just simply means that as we're making day-to-day -day decisions, I need to make sure we manage our work so that 85% of our items continue to finish by that line. Because this is the one place that you can control where your dots on the cycle time scatter plot end up. As your work items get finished and they move to done, they disappear from this chart and they become your historical data. They're now part of your lagging data, right? And once they hit done, we can't control where they land anymore. And then they start affecting our ability to forecast. So these items here, when they're aging, when we're managing our board and moving work and making choices about what to prioritize, this is the best time to decide whether or not we need to take different action because you know this is aging or whatnot. So we want to we want to make sure that we at least get 85% of our items done 
by 16 days or less here. But if we weren't happy with 16, then we probably want to make sure that even more items finish by then. Because if I do that over time uh, and I finish more and more items under this 85th percentile, then that line will start coming down. The 85th percentile line won't be at 16 days anymore. It'll be at 15 or 14, right? So that's one way that we can use the SLE to go down from that 48 days SLE that we hate, right? To get down to the lower SLE that we'd really like to have. That makes sense. Now, this is not the only decision point that you need to make in, in, regards, to, um, in regards to making choices on a day-to-day -day basis. Like you're not predictability or death. You know, there are other things that you have to take into account. Um, there might be other forces that you'll say, you know what, this might make something go past the 85th percentile line and that might impact our predictability, but that was a choice that we had to make because this, you know, not doing this other thing would have a worse impact on us, right? So it's not the only thing that you need to think about. But uh, if you want to become more predictable, the very first thing that you should do is start monitoring the aging of your work, okay? And helping you get your work items done in a younger and younger age. Now, something really cool here is um, is these colors. Um, and the colors are a representation of when to worry. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Troy McGinnis, but one of the amazing things that he says about charts is they should tell you when to worry about your data. Because if I took these colors off and I just had dots, it might be a little harder for me to know if this dot here, that's 10 days old, at this point in my workflow, what does that mean for its likelihood of finishing by the 85th percent? You know, should I be worried or not yet? So there are some ways that you can that you can have tools help you do this. So you don't have to do it manually, but you can take uh, the pacing of past information. So items that have finished by that time before, where were they in the workflow, right? And if certain items are on a trajectory to take longer based on that, they'll fall in these different color bands. And so that way you could pull this chart, say in a stand-up or a daily scrum or something like that, and say, in addition to talking about blockers or other things that might help us create our plan for the day, one additional thing that we should help make our plan for the day is age of items. So. I might want to talk about things in orange for sure, and probably things in yellow, but things in green we might not have to talk about because they're sort of on track to finish in the time we want them to finish. Okay. Um, does anyone uh, have any idea? I think Sergeet, you have been to the class before about, about this chart, so, so you know this, and I apologize if it's too late for this much uh, numbers talk, but there's, just in case there's at least one of you who wants to know this, there's a really cool other way to use these lines, uh, these percentile lines to help you with knowing when to worry or not. So I'll ask an easy question first. If we are going with an 85th percentile as our SLE, that means we know that 85% of our items are likely to finish by our SLE, so what's our, what's our downside there? What percent of items might go past that, that we know upfront before we even start? What's the percent? Good thing. Good thing, right? Thing. So we know that before a dot even begins its journey, there's a 15% chance that it might finish beyond our 16 day ideal, right? So, whoops. Um, when it hits this 50% line, that can give us some more information. So we can use these sort of mile markers to help us know. So when it hits the 50% line, like this item here that is seven days old, we know a little bit more information. We know that 50% of our items have already finished by this point. This one's not finished yet, right? So now, because 50% of our items have finished, the chance has doubled that it will finish beyond our 16 days. So we went from 15% to 30. 
So you can use these percentile lines as gauges if you don't have colors and you're making this chart on your own, you can draw other percentile lines to help you know when to worry about this chart. So if I'm using 85%, it starts off with a 15% chance of taking longer. If it gets to our 50% line, we have a 30% chance. If it gets to 70, it grows and so on. So the higher it gets, the more chance it has of being the one, being one of the 15% that passes the line, right? Because the more and more dots that finish, um, the more likely the ones that have it are the ones that will pass that line, if that makes a little bit of sense. So four flow metrics, we've got our cycle time, we've got our throughput, we've got our width, and we've got our work item age. Okay, but how do you, how do you get started, right? Like, I don't just expect you tomorrow to come in and say, here's a bunch of flow metrics that now you have to figure out what to do with, right? So one of the things that most people start with that I, I see finds the most success is by starting with understanding your cycle times. So starting with a cycle time scatter plot, okay? Just by glancing at it, you get to see a little bit about your predictability, right? Um, just by the sheer fact that um, literally if your dots are more condensed, you're more predictable than if they're spread out, okay? So if we have dots sort of spread out all across our chart, we want to work to condense them, condense them, condense them, right? And that's where the, the aging chart comes into play, which is next, right? And we also talked about how we can use the cycle time scatter plot to determine our SLE or our forecast for how long it will take to finish a future single item, right? So this is a really good place to start, okay? If you don't start with anything else, start with that. But then very quickly, start to take that baseline of your cycle time scatter plot and drive change by paying attention to your aging, right? Um, you can start monitoring your age daily. You can start making decisions that allow age to impact um, and improve your cycle times. And by improving enough of your cycle times, you improve your single item forecast, which is your SLE, right? If I have an SLE of 16 days and I work to reduce age long enough, by enough, then my 85% SLE will go down and therefore I have become more predictable, right? Just by sheer definition. Um, if you do nothing else, just do these two things and you can improve so much, right? And I have a lot of people that I talk to. Um, that make a lot of sense that they focus on this before they worry about doing the fancier stuff with Monte Carlo forecasting and using throughput to forecast multiple items, right? Um, and the reason that they do that um, is that, sorry, I have an alarm going off to give my son melatonin. <laughs> um, yeah, so, when you have a very unstable or unpredictable system um, and you try to use that data to forecast, then you've got a lot of outliers and things that it's accounting for. So in essence, you'll have some pretty padded outcomes. You can get, you can do a probabilistic forecast and say 85% of the time we'll finish these things in 200 days or less, right? Um, but if you focus on stabilizing your system and becoming more predictable, you're going to be much happier with the answers you get in your probabilistic forecasts. So a lot of people will say, start with stabilizing your system. And that goes back to paying attention to cycle times and keeping them the same or improving them by paying attention to aging. Then jump into forecasting with your throughput and the Monte Carlo simulations, right? Um, if you're using Scrum, then here's a nice little chart for, or a slide for which charts are good and which kinds of events. And, you know, if you think about it, you think about the purpose of which event. Uh, sprint planning is um, one to help us figure out 
what and how we're going to do within our sprint so and how much we can get done so we will be using some multi-item forecast things so that's throughputs and monte carlos what might we look at on a daily basis well the aging and the sle and etc so um there's some key charts that might make sense by event that's pretty much what i wanted to share with you but to summarize it is that I guess what I want to say is if you do nothing else, start with cycle time and age. And then um, what's interesting is that I forgot to tell you is that if you've done any Kanban training, you might leave that Kanban training feeling like um, work in progress limits are the silver bullet. They are the thing that is going to fix you right? And it, that's actually right. Like limiting your work in progress will improve lots of things, but there are ways where you can stay within your work in progress limits and let items sit there and sit there and sit there. You just ignore the blocked ones. You know, maybe you got two blocked ones and a whip load of five and you just keep cycling through your other three. Well, no flags are being thrown in your, in your uh, whip limits because you're staying within them but you've got items sitting there aging and aging and when they eventually finish they're going to be outliers in your cycle time scatter plot right and that will affect your ability to forecast easily so if you do nothing else pay attention to aging with the context of your historical data and paying attention to aging will lead you to do things like limiting your work in progress like making your work items smaller you know, like having different policies about how you interact and prevent dependencies and everything else. So the charts will help give you what's happening. And then we have to go build the story that created that chart and start to understand why that happened and make our own decisions and experiments on how to improve things before. And I've got some, um, the, the, the book that I really want to recommend is Actionable Agile Metrics for Predictability um, by Dan Vacanti and also When Will It Be Done? And then there's a couple of books that, I'm, uh, that I really like that I haven't put on the slide by Annie Duke. Um, one that's been out for a long time is called Thinking in Bets. And she's a cool lady that um, has a psychology degree and is also a professional poker player. Um, she, her book, Thinking in Bets, was really great. And there's a new one out that I'm listening to now called How to Decide. And it's all about how when you recognize you can't be certain, you have to learn how to think about probabilities and likelihoods of different outcomes. And it walks you through the process of weighing those likelihoods and thinking about the impact of what if I fall into the downside? What if I fall into that 15%? and um, helps you learn how to make decisions in that sort of probabilistic outcome. So that's what I wanted to share. I wanted to find out what you wanna talk about now, what questions can I answer, what conversations do we want to have together to help us synthesize yeah. learning? Yeah. That was awesome. Um, there's a few questions posted in chat um, that were posted yeah. during, during, the, during the session itself. So I'll read those out first. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we've got one from, Matt Spottiswood, um, which is, can I exclude throughput data from the Monte Carlo estimate? For example, I might want to only select the last three months of data rather than use data over the past year. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can. And um, so I'll show you this on Actionable Agile, but I want to let everyone know that this is, Actionable Agile is not the only way that you can, that you can use um, Monte Carlo simulations, um, but since you asked, I will answer it for here. So um, there's layouts to turn on and off different things. So if I want to control just pulling in a certain period of time, I can use the date control and choose which set of the data that I want. So yeah, you totally can do that. And if you're doing it with spreadsheets or manual other ways or different tools, there are probably similar ways to do that as well. Thank, great question. Any other questions? Okay. Um, there was another one from here's Ian. Um, yeah, so the assumption of having a stable system is important for Little's law. I think it's my yeah. query. Yeah, true? and 
Yeah, I, I, it definitely is. Um, so Little's Law is, you know, that relationship between cycle time, throughput, and work in progress. And we can't, you, there, there is um, a mathematical equation there. Let me see if I can get back to it. Um, it won't take too long. There we go. So average cycle time equals average work in progress divided by average throughput. And wouldn't life be so simple if we could just plug numbers in and solve for X, right? What should our work in progress be? Well, let's plug in some numbers and get that. Or what will our cycle time specifically be? Well, let's put in these and we should get the answer. But um, as they pointed out, there are some assumptions that would have to be true for this to work out like that. Also, given that this is still all averages and we talked about the flaw of averages a little bit as well, right? Um, but our systems aren't always as stable as they would have to be for this to prove true. And there, you can look online and see a lot of assumptions, but it's things like everything that started ends up getting finished. So it doesn't mean that you have to finish it even though you finish the work, even though um, you decided that that's not valuable anymore. We're not saying suck it up and just finished it, right? But they're saying like mark it done, make sure it goes into the done column and say cancel it or something like that. The data has to know it was finished. Um, it also means having an average, uh, having a consistent uh, number of items in your process at one time, finishing work at the same rate as you start work, having that sort of consistency, those parallel lines in the uh, cycle time, in the cumulative flow diagram. So yeah, um, those are all things that would be great to have. And as we use these flow metrics and as we look at things like aging and, and getting our throughput stable, getting our cycle time stable, the things that we have to do to get there will get us closer and closer to those assumptions. But I like to think of it as a perfection challenge. Um, we'll never get there, but we can sure try, right? We can try to get as close as we can um, as long as it makes sense. All right, next question is from Sergio. Are the percentiles in the aging whip using all historical data? Um, specifically in, um, in Actionable Agile, it, you can change that. Um, so again, here on, um, sorry, I gotta move this out of the way, done item selection. So you're seeing here that uh, our, our date control looks like the cycle time scatter plot. And that's because I can, I can choose which data I wanna use to set these lines. Um, yeah, so you can just choose the last month or, or whatever. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And if you want, here's something. Um, so again, whether or not you do this yourself, um, if you, you can look at the trend of any given percentile line, right? So here's, here's the journey of my 85th percentile line over time, right? And I can see how, my, how consistent I am with my 85th percentile. Is it really skyrocketing up? Is it improving quite a lot? Like, it looks like we were improving and then, ah, we're going up a little bit. So there's some course correction we need to do there, right? Um, because that, that's something that can help you know how you're doing with your predictability ever, because we're only seeing it as it is right now, but what's its journey been, right? So you can look at how far you've come with improving your predictability. And that's something that you can also measure by hand, because you can create this, um, all of these metrics, by the way, that we've talked about, you can, I'm just going to pull this up. Um, okay, I don't know what's going on there. Demo land for you. But all you really need is a start date and an end date for each item. And you can create all of these charts. You can do every single thing that we talked about with knowing which item you're talking about and knowing its start date and end date, right? And so I can plot each one of these dots with just that information. I can calculate these percentile lines after plotting those dots. I can track the journey of that all with just those three simple pieces of data. So while there are fancy tools, you don't have to have them. They make your life easier, but you can do all of this flow metric stuff with a $0 budget if you don't count your time. <laughs> Let's just say that. <laughs> and time is money, but you know, it's, 
where, you know, you don't always have the funds to go buy shiny tools, but the good news is you don't have to. Cool. Um, next question. I think I already know the answer to this one. It's by Genty. Is there a particular tool, ALM, you suggest that can automatically depict all the four metrics? Um, well, just disclosure, I own Actable Agile, so of course I'm going to I'm gonna say that that's a good tool. Yeah. Um, a lot of your... But you asked about ALMs, like application lifecycle management tools. So you'll have tools like Jira or Azure DevOps that will do some of these, but not all of them. And um, you need to understand how they're constructed. Uh, and then you'll find that in each one of those, you're able to pull in other tools that can help you or export your data into other tools if those tools don't give you everything that you need. Cool. Okay. Next question is from Bogdan. Um, if Project sponsor wants to know when all of the backlog can be delivered. How can I do the forecast? In other words, mm -hmm. how do I prepare the items in the backlog for forecasting? And how do I use the flow metrics to actually perform the full forecast? Yeah, no, this is a great question because honestly, I just got finished today. It's been a long day. I had a class, my third day of a three-day class of um, teaching people how to use these flow metrics for forecasting and predictability. And we talked about this backlog question quite a lot, right? Because we had people in this class that are really concerned about what customers care about from when they asked for it to when it gets done. And all of these flow metrics are from when it starts to when it's done. So how do I deal with that discrepancy, right? Well, there's a couple of things that you have to ask yourself first, because look, I could come in here and I could say, oh, that's not what I wanted. I could say, hey, let's check my backlog. And then I could add all that time in the backlog to all of these. And I could go to my aging chart and I could see my backlog. And I could use, I could use all of this information um, in, in my charts. Because I told you, you can measure from any start point to any finish point, right? So you can measure from enter backlog to enter done, right? That's totally possible. But you have to ask yourself if that's smart. Because yes, we want to give people that information, but is your backlog always only full of items that will absolutely get done, right? Do you do everything in your backlog, right? That's one thing to ask about is, you know, are they all things that will be getting done anytime soon? So generally we treat our backlog as this sort of pit for things that we might eventually do. If that's how you're using your backlog, then trying to put that into a forecast isn't going to be very useful. If you don't use your backlog in a predictable way, then you can't get predictable outcomes from the data in that. Um, so you can, but I question if you should. Um, so you could also think about coming up with a point of commitment. So maybe visualizing when you've decided, yes, this is something that we will do. And then, you know, maybe making a column for that. Usually you know, we still, want uh, yeah. we want a predictability for the release, right? Release backlog, not yeah. a product backlog. Yeah. So release backlog makes yeah. a lot more sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because it, it's, I thank you for clarifying that. Because when you have a release backlog, yeah, there's still a chance that some things might not make it, but you have a higher likelihood that they've been considered and that you'll take it through to the end. And so, yeah, some might fall out, but you'll, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a much more sound approach for including a backlog. So in that case, you might do all of this from the point of view of the release manager or the, 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 the product manager or whatever, and they might be looking at, you know, from the beginning of the release backlog to complete and the teams doing the work inside to optimize their piece might be doing it from leaving the release backlog you know, from starting it to finishing it. So that goes back to different people, different roles may have different points of view and their start points might be different from yours. That doesn't mean that they can't take the same data set, just widen it a little bit and do the same kind of stuff for them. Okay, um, next question from Dylan. Can you, will there be a link to the slides? Yeah, absolutely. I'll send that out. All right, uh, moving on to next question. Gabrielle, um, the scatter plot didn't say anything about the size of the work items. How can you use it to define a SLE to do right sizing? Can you elaborate a little on that? 
Absolutely. And that's a great question. Um, and I'm going to say something, but then I'll caveat it. So don't discount it completely right away. So um, when we're looking at using your data to forecast with these probabilities, um, all kinds of conditions uh, and their variations are accounted for. So these items had this cycle time while you were working on, a, you know, multiple items at one time. So your work in progress uh, limits affected each individual dot's cycle time. Um, your team size affects each individual cycle time. All these other conditions affect the individual cycle time and size of the work is one component of things that affect that. Um, so you can look at your entire data set and say that all of our work, regardless of size, 85% of those items finish in um, 16 days or less. Uh, and the question that you're asking is, I think a way to say that is, if I were to try to filter this down, uh, let's see what this has here. Uh, I don't have such great metadata in this particular thing, but if I were to try to segment this data so that I could look into items of this size, what's that SLE? Items of that size, what's that SLE? You can certainly do that. But the question is, is there, how much value does that bring you for the effort that you have? Um, now, if you are trying to, if I had this data set and these were say epics and these were stories, right? And these things out here were subtasks, I might want to segment so that it's like for like, because those are completely different scales of, of Object. So I might look at my epics separately than I look at the stuff that is supposed to be being finished in a sprint or whatnot. So I might segment that way. But um, we don't think that it is very important to worry about size too much. Uh, first of all, you can't make everything the same size. Uh, that wouldn't be very realistic. Uh, we do still think that. Um, Having items smaller often helps us to have faster cycle times. Um, I don't feel like I'm answering it very well because my brain is a little bit mushy today. <laughs> but, um, but I think what I'd say, the reason that you can use the SLE for right sizing, we're not trying to say, is this item based on this mishmash of different types of things? It, you know, um, is, well, this, what we're saying with the SLE is, is this item that we're looking at in our backlog, it's more of an art. Do we feel like this is something that could finish in our eight days or less, in our 12 days or less? We don't know for sure because we haven't, you know, we, we haven't done a lot, but we're saying if it doesn't pass that sniff test, then that's a signal that we should do more refinement on the work and get it to a point where we feel like, yeah, we feel like that has a high likelihood of finishing within that SLE. Right. And maybe you want to refine it even further than that. If you feel like that adds value, you can certainly do that. But um, we're just saying that it can be used as a tool to know if it's small enough to finish within the SLE so that your predictability doesn't worsen. Making it smaller can help improve the predictability and get that SLE farther and farther down. But we want to make sure that you know at least you feel like it's small enough not to make your SLE worse, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, next question is from Matt. Is there anything in Actionable Agile that would help with blocker clustering? Um, we don't pull out a lot of blockers into separate reports and things, but what we do do on particular charts is help you highlight items that were blocked because we do, we pull in whether or not an item was ever blocked and how long it was blocked for. And then, you know, so like for instance, on this particular chart, you can say, hey, all of these dots that are red had time in which during their life they were blocked, right? And then we can look and we can see here, uh, it had three days where it was, it had the blocked flag on it or tag or whatever your system uses, right? Um, and what, one additional thing that we allow you to do 
is we say by default, your cycle times include the time blocks because it is part of your cycle time. But what if you waved a magic wand and all your blockers were gone from your past? What would your cycle time have looked like if you could magically get rid of all of your blockers? Then you can see that sort of the shift in that. That's at the level right now that we're helping you look at blockers. Um, we don't have any blocker specific um, charts and things like that. At least not yet. Okay. Um, next question from Paolo. Um, do you track flow efficiency? I know Jose has some things to say about flow efficiency as well. So maybe we can hear from him too. But yes, we do have a flow efficiency chart. Um, it does require you to build your board in such a way that you can get information about weight, right? Um, this is a pretty decent one because there's some obvious cues. Right, we know that when work is in analysis active, it's more likely to be at least expected to be being actively worked on. Where when it's done with that, we've moved it into a place that signals it's queuing and ready for the next date. So there's some data for the chart to know it's waiting. Uh, we can also include blocked time as, as queuing because our cycle times are made up of active time and waiting time, right? Those two things combined together to make total cycle time. And this chart needs us to give it the data to separate those out. And if we're not giving it the data to separate those out, it can't effectively give us the thing. Now, here's the thing. The higher level view you have, the more valuable a flow efficiency is. So if I were to look at the flow efficiency of a single item, it's not super helpful, right? If I look at the flow efficiency of items in aggregate in a team, it's more helpful than looking at it for a single item, but not as helpful for looking at it across an entire value stream where handoffs are happening and knowing the impact of the handoffs. Um, I'll let Jose say anything else he wants, but for me, the value of a flow efficiency metric is to help us know where we should spend our limited time for improving stuff. And what it can tell us is do we spend most of our time waiting or most of our time working on items. So out of the cycle time, is it more waiting or is it more working? If it's more waiting, then spend time reducing weight. If it's more working, spend time improving how fast you can do the work. A lot of times we just focus on spending time improving how fast we do the work when like 80% of our cycle times are full of weight. So that's the level. Jose, you've got an excellent blog post on this. Why don't you add a few uh, words of wisdom? Danger is the time box is coming. <laughs> no, I will. I I agree with what you were saying there. Like, um, low efficiency is a, is a really really good indicator. Um, but uh, it really comes to age. Um, to be to be really powerful. Um, beyond the team, when you're looking at all those interactions between multiple teams, between areas of a business, at team level, I I usually say that this is a dangerous. Um, metric to use, but um, I know that we don't have a lot of time, and so there is more questions. What I can do is like I'll put a, a couple of links on the on the chat if people want to explore it more. That'd be awesome. Yeah, thanks. Cool. All right. Next question is from Genty. Um, we don't move the work items backwards. What are the main reasons and impact if it, it impact it will have if that is not observed? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I think Genty, if you want to jump on the video, more than welcome to ask your question in person. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, apparently my camera is not working. Um, um, well, typically, uh, you know, when we are tracking the work items using the Kanban board, uh, we don't want to move the work items backward. Uh, that's and and I just wanted to clarify a little bit better from your standpoint. What are the main reasons. I, I have yeah. a few ideas, but I would like to hear your opinion. And, and uh, then the potential impact if we are not in, uh, observing that, that, that sort of rule. No, that's a, that's a great, I'm pulling up something so you'll watch me navigate while I, I do this. Um, so yeah, there is a very good reason 
uh, for when you should and should not move your work items back. Um, and I'm, I'm pulling this up. So I do have information that we can share on how we handle backwards movement in a workflow. And this is for actionable agile, but honestly, if you're using charts like a cumulative flow diagram, anyone who's building a cumulative flow diagram should be doing it the same way. So even though this says actionable agile, you can read this as here's why we don't move things backwards unless we really need to. Um, so I'll talk about that in just a second. I'll try to make it concise. So when we move things through a board, a lot of us think about columns as people's inboxes for functional roles. Like here's my dev inbox and here's my testers inbox and here's my analyst inbox. So then they think, well, anytime something needs development, like it came in here into testing and then we found a bug. So now it's gotta go back to dev, right? Because that's where the devs work. That's not actually what the workflow is meant to visualize. It's not meant to visualize functional team inboxes. It's meant to visualize the life cycle of a work item, right? on its journey mm -hmm. from start to finish. So then we have to think about our workflow slightly differently, right? We have to think about what does it mean to be an analysis? And we have to get a, okay with the fact that testers, devs, and analysts might all have work to do in the analysis phase, right? We might write test plans. We might write pseudocode. We might you know, write some requirement stocks or whatever. And then it moves to dev and we still might have all three people working in that phase of that particular item. So it's about the work, not the people, right? Now, when do we move stuff backwards? We move it backwards when it was never ready to go to that phase in the first place. So it moves into the, the execution or development phase or whatever. And, and we realize, it didn't meet the criteria to get here in the first place. It's just not ready for this part of its life cycle. So then you absolutely should move it back because it was a mistake to move it forward in the first place. But let's say we have something in testing and we found a bug, right? So we move it back to dev. Then we lose some visibility. We lose visibility that it was in test in the first place, right? And um, we, we make it harder to know how long it's actually been in that testing phase of its life cycle, because essentially what you're saying is that you never expect to find a bug in test, right? Because every time you find one, you're saying it wasn't ready for tests. We got to move back. So you can have that point of view and that's fine. That means you're never really going to have a test column that shows anything no more than like a day or something, because it only goes there when it's, we've already figured out it's ready because we've really already done all the testing, right? And that's just really more of a validation phase than testing happens in dev, right? So we have to really think about what we're saying with visualizing this. Instead, a lot of us might wanna think of this as a test cycle. And so we might wanna look at this column as a couple of things that people have done. Either we keep it in this testing column for all of the initial testing and the cycles of fixing it. And what that tells us is that over time, we can see all these things are spending a lot of time in tests. How can we reduce the test cycles? How can we make it so that there's not as many bugs hitting tests? And you know, it gives us a lot of data to really focus on where the problem is. If we push that problem all the way back to dev, we wouldn't be able to differentiate original development from bug fix post-test development, right? And so we lose the ability to know where the problem is actually started. And some people say, that's great, but I still want to see a difference between initial round of testing and then a fix phase. So I'm like, fine, create a testing column and then create a, a post-test fixes column, right? And you've got the best of both worlds. It's still a journey that's moving towards completion, right? And you don't lose any data to help you make decisions. So the driver there should be, what do I lose by making the choice of how to move my item? What visibility do I lose? What data do I lose? Uh, for me, it's not right or wrong. It's what happens if I make this decision, right? And so last thing, when you move items backwards and you're building things like cumulative flow diagrams, the way that we have to do it is that we have to, if you move it out of test and back into dev, we take all that time that it was in test and throw it onto the dev column. So it looks like it was never in test because you're saying it shouldn't have been there, it moved backwards. So that might be a little confusing, but you can, we'll put this in here. You can read this or you can go to actionableagile.com and 
uh, get to our documentation where we have this. That's great. And it's in, yeah, it's in Dan's book as well. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I actually have his book. Yeah, great, great yeah. job. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I think um, now's now's a good time to to call it call it a day. There's still a few questions left unanswered. Um, Apologise if we didn't get around to it, but some great questions that you've you gone through as well. You um, can send them to me, and I can try to answer them either in a blog sure. post or directly to people if they want to share it with me. Sure. Yeah, we could do that. Um, I was I was also going to mention that um, we have another metric session with Jose in September. Um, so be sure to look out for that one as well. Um, again. Thank you, Julia, for taking the time for this session. Awesome session, so valuable. Lots of, lots of great advice in there as well. And I think the video is gonna be a really useful resource as well to share with your colleagues. Okay, so yeah, that's, that's that really. Thanks everyone, have a good evening. And yeah, Thank we'll you. Call, it, call it a night. Bye. Thanks, Julia. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye.